So, this morning, I hope I can get through this properly. Um, this, this past three Wednesdays have been just magnificent with Margie upstairs. And there's three takeaways that I want to just kind of review quick because it's going to lead into what I have to say. This morning, I want to talk to you about the revelation of sonship. It's the revel- when, you, when you realize that you're a son of God, like when you realize that you're your father's, your natural father's son, I just ran into an issue this week. It's, it's been a pretty bad week for me. It's been a pretty bad week. A couple hospital visits. My car, both my trucks totally broke down. But I called my natural father. And I just mentioned to him, I was, you know, I was talking, he, want, he needs help on the house. And he goes, oh, what would you say, your truck? Oh, just come get my truck. So my natural father wants me to come get his truck and just use it just free of charge. It's a pretty cool thing. God has your purpose, and it's free of charge. He has your purpose, and he wants you to use it. No one else is going to use it. You're going to use it. Maybe you can say, I'm going to use my purpose. It's, it's so, so key and so vital that you use it because no one else is going to use it. The revelation, can I tell you this? The, rev, the revelation of sonship comes once in a lifetime. Once in a lifetime. Now, some of you are thinking, well, revelations come all the time. Yet, yeah, no, they do come all the time. But when the revelation of sonship hits you, you have to pick it up and run with it. It's yours to run with. And, and, and all it is is identity. That's it. It's as it's, it's simple as that. It's identity. It's knowing who you are. I know who I am, so I call my dad, Bill Elbin, and he says, come get my truck. God spoke to me in worship and said, there's healing that needs to take place. Call it out. And I did. And I hope that you guys received your healing. So Margie, in the first week, she was going on with the, um, with the kind of the roots of the church and how it was, how it was built and uh, the coffee and donuts. Right, Leanne? Marilyn? Gary? Mallow Cups? They weren't there. He just likes them. And, uh, you know, she, she was searching for her purpose. What do I do? So if you don't know Pastor Chris and Pastor Margie, they're the senior pastors of this church. And Pastor Chris is a very driven man. He's going to see things come to pass. And Margie's had to come along with it. And she's had to learn, and, and he just gives testimony of how she wasn't very talkative when she was growing up, and she was very shy, and she had to overcome, you know, there was 10 kids to the Scrinzi clan. I don't know if you were a part of any of the festivities of the Scrinzi family reunion that was just this last weekend or whatever it was. It's a blur. It's like 2 a.m., and you're, like, getting up and going for it. I mean, there's, like, 10, so there's 10 kids. There was 28 grandkids, 28, something like that. And now there's lots of great grandkids running around. It was a superb time. But Margie had to learn to talk inside of that. I hear hear Scarinzi's talking. See? They'll interrupt you. They'll just interrupt you. It just floods. It comes in. I'm kidding. But But that's what she was dealing with. And I just, when she was saying, I had to, you know, God, she was telling Chris, God got in the car with you, not with me. You deal with your call. And so I just, I looked at her, I closed out the meeting the second week, and I just said, you know what, Margie? God might have gotten the car with him that one time. But if it wasn't for you getting in the car with him every other time, we wouldn't have what we have. We wouldn't have coffee and donuts. We wouldn't have the revelation that we have of hospitality. We wouldn't have these things. We wouldn't be having a church picnic today. I mean, maybe if Jake was here a little earlier, we would have had some picnics. 
My man's an animal when it comes to this stuff. But if it wasn't for her, you get that. Like, if it wasn't for her getting in the car with him, driving to church, coming home, driving, counseling people, seeing people delivered, seeing people set free, wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. Wouldn't be in this building. That second week, I just remember saying, don't let the ghosts of your past interfere with your reality today. I've been dwelling on that for two weeks. Don't let the ghosts of your past interfere with your reality today. Because what is your reality today? Do you know what your reality today is? Your your reality today lies in your identity that you received through sonship. And then Margie, was, she was talking about Bible stories. I, I just love it when she talks. I love it when she tells Bible stories. I, I, do you love it when she tells Bible stories? It's like you're almost in it. You're there because she has this, like, this dry humor about her that she's like, you know, you're walking and she's talking about David and Goliath and she's talking about uh, Naaman. And, but David and Goliath, if you just think about that situation for a second. Think about that situation for a second. Put yourself in David's shoes. You're facing a giant. You're facing a giant, and you have to kill him, or he's going to kill you. And we just think of this little shepherd kid gathering these stones and winging them up and slapping them into some big guy's forehead. I often try to play out in my head what that looks like. I often try to think about, like, what to put yourself in the situation because the situation was real. It was a reality. David faced a reality. You have giants in your life. You're going to face them. You're going to face them day in and day out. Whether they're big or little, it doesn't matter. But it's the sonship, it's the identity that you have inside of you that's going to make all the difference. It's knowing who you are. Knowing what God's given you. She kind of touched on the revival theme a little bit and um, talked about how we, we love to see the Holy Spirit move and we love to see the manifestations of the Spirit. We love to see people healed. We love to see people saved. We love to see prophetic words. We love to see the gifts of God in full action. The gifts of the Spirit in full manifestation. Do you love to see those things? Do you love to be healed? Do you love to love on your God? Do you love what he does for us. I love it so much. The only thing that they're lacking in the revival meeting is identity. That's that's it. They want more. They want more. And it's okay to want more. It's definitely okay to want more. I want more. I'm on a journey in my life. Every time I take a corner, I get more. Every time I ask Dave Hofline for something, I get more. We work in the office. Every time I turn the corner, every time we talk to each other, there's more. It's like more things are dropped. More things are dropped. And we're prepping for these meetings. And we're going after the Wednesday Night Cafe stuff. And we want, because we want you to see more. That's our job. That's our job as servants. That's that's a pastoral job. We we look at our crowd and we go, how can Jake and Julia benefit from this message? How can the new person benefit from this message? We care about the people. We care about driving the identity into somebody so they don't have to cry out for something that already belongs to them. I'm not into crying out for something that already belongs to me. If I know God works through me in healing, then I'm going to heal. I'm not going to cry out. I'm going to grab that gift and go, and God's going to download into me what needs to happen, and I'm going to say, all right, you got a problem? Let's work it out. Healing takes place. It's as simple as that. It's, it's, that's identity. 
It's the only thing they're lacking. To me, just my only, my, my personal thing is just, it's just like a, it's a selfish thing. I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to keep crying out. There's so many people. There's so many souls. There's so many people that need to be reached. They need to be reached by you. If you keep crying out for what you already have, you're not going to reach those people. You're going to be distracted by keep calling out and calling out and calling out and calling God. And God saying, I'm here, son. I'm here the whole time. What are you crying out for? He doesn't want me crying out for what I already have. But I will seek out what's around the corner for me. I will find out what God has for me. I will step through that door. I will walk down that hallway. I will get wherever wherever he meets me. He met me on the lawnmower yesterday. He met me on the lawnmower yesterday. I was trying to finish up my lawn, and my field was getting pretty high, and I'm thinking... I don't like ticks, so I try to keep as low as possible. And so I was sitting there on the lawnmower. Out of nowhere, God drops Eve into my head. So, Eve, the Lord had told me that you're going to take the music in this house to another level. It's, 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 it's so substantial that, that people are going to come to you. People are going to come to you to figure out what you did. He's saying, don't worry about what the other people are doing. Get your information and plug it in. But don't worry about what the other people are doing. Don't worry about the work. Don't worry about the things that are going on in other people's lives because you're about to set a standard that is so powerful and so anointed. And it's going to it's, it's be such a substance that when people listen to the music, it's just going to break. I mean, the chains, the, th- the problems are just going to fall when they listen to the music. It was, that's amazing. That's amazing. And the worship team says, amen. The worship team says, amen. Everybody should say amen, actually, because you're all. Because you know what? You know what? You know what I love? When I lead worship, I love to just quiet a song down and listen to you sing. You're God's greatest choir. You're God's greatest choir. Maybe you can say, I'm God's greatest choir. You ever hear Pastor Chris sing? No, you don't want to. But is he watching? He's in Auburn. Oh, I got time. Uh, but he, he'll always say, I'm going to be the, the worship director in heaven or the choir director in heaven, right? And uh, so <laughs> I, we always laugh and kind of move on. But what we were in the prayer room this morning, and, uh, and in the, back here in and AIM just kind of came out. And so AIM's been having some issues going on. It's driving me crazy. Because I can't stand the devil. We can't stand him. We don't let him in our lives. We don't, we don't entertain those thoughts. So she steps forward. And usually the, the one that's leading worship will kind of come in and, like, they'll get the you know, start praying and whatever. So she steps forward and says, this morning, guys, I, I need some prayer. I need, I need some prayer. And um, Julia, what you said, I don't even think you realize the, the gravity of what your words have. When she, she prayed out just one note, just one lyric, I actually wrote it down. Just one word, just one lyric, just one note. Yeah. And everything can change. And that's what the music's going to do. That's what the music's going to do. Because it has to. We have to get on a track that's gripping. We have to get on a track. We're, 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 we're gripping something. I don't want to loosely handle, like if some we, we put together cafe nights. I don't want to loosely just call people and say, will you give your testimony? Will you say something? Will you, you know, was, can you just take care of that? No, I want to grip the thing, and I want to say, that's your testimony. That's what I want to hear about. Bring it out, and I mean, just shake the people. Grip the people with your testimony. 
When we have testimony night up there, it's just so powerful. It, it's so good to hear what's going on inside people's lives. I mean, there's so many people that come to the church, and you don't know what's happening inside of their lives. You say hi, you say bye, but, on the, but after that, that's it. What if that person was healed from cancer? What if they're holding it? Barry, what, what, if, what if they're holding a gift that you need? My inheritance is inside of you. My inheritance is inside of you. So, so Margie got through the three weeks, and, and, she, was, and she, was, she was talking about purpose. And I just wrote down, first sonship was revealed to me, and then my purpose was revealed through my sonship and my identity. First sonship was revealed to me, and then my purpose was revealed through my sonship, my identity. Now, the definition of revelation, a surprising and previously unknown fact, especially one that is made known in a dramatic way. So that's what happened to me. 2007, I was standing in the back. We didn't have the balcony. We had a big, fat soundboard thing back there, and I remember being back there, and Pastor Chris was up here on a Wednesday night, and he just starts spilling his soul out about sonship. And something gripped me inside. And I, I said, I, I have to know more about that. I have to know more about that. I need to sit with him. I, I, need, I need to study these things. I need to go after these things. And so I ran right up to him after service was over. And I said, I don't care what it takes. You need to disciple me. Who's discipling you? Who are you discipling? We should all be having people over us and under us. I mean, like we should be surrounded by the body. That's what the body is, right? That, it's, it, it's, like, it's, just an, it's like a it's an organic organism that's just around you. Different facets of the ministry, different people that are doing different things. And one of the biggest things that I, when I was sitting there that second week on Wednesday night when Margie was speaking, and, and, it's, and the Lord, the Spirit spoke to me and just said, unity is in your own lane. Unity is in your own lane. Don't let the devil lie to you about unity. Don't let him come after you about unity. I hope you're here. And this is, this is very, very important. It, when, you, when you cross your lane into someone else's lane, you're going to get into an accident. If you cross onto the shoulder and drive into the ditch, you're going to die. You're going to get hurt. And what happens when you get hurt? Now you need time to recover. I've been there. I've hurt myself. I've had self-inflicted wounds. And sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it takes a couple days. But all I know is we can't waste any time. We've got to move forward in what God has for us. So I know if I stay inside of that lane, now, now listen, I'm not talking about helping other people, other churches, and going in different directions. But what I am saying is that each church that's planted around here, this, this, is, this is important. Each church that's planted around here has a specific purpose in the kingdom of God. Each pastor in this area, you need to be praying for because they have a specific purpose in this, in this community. The local church, wherever you attend, that's where you need to be. But we also need to be, look, it's not, I'm not saying we have to go join and do different things, but do you understand what I'm saying? It's like they have their own. So when, when things are happening, I don't want to distract another pastor from what his vision is with God. What did God call him to do? Okay, he's running with that. I'm running with this. I'm running with this. And it's communication is the, is the key. Is the key to unity is communication. And staying in your own lane. I have to stay inside of my own lane if I want to be successful. And I'm not just talking about like a personal success. I'm talking about successful in the kingdom. 
I mean, set it on cruise control and stay in your lane and move inside of that gift that God's given you. So important. So important. Oh, man. So sonship was revealed. A revelation. A surprising and previously unknown fact was revealed to me. And then my purpose was revealed through my identity. My identity, identity, the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. The fact of being who or what a person or thing is. That's identity. So if you're identifying with God, you're saying, I, I, I'm identifying with, with what he is. I'm identifying with what he is. I'm identifying as a son. And when I get identified as a son or a daughter, I grab my purpose and I start running with it. And Margie said the, that was week three. I didn't get to that. Sorry. She said it was, it was perfect Margie. She says, what does Christ look like? Do you remember when she said that? She said, what's Christ look like? And she does one of these. I was like, that's, that's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. Because we, we're, we're born Christ-like. Do you believe me? We're Christ-like. He's our elder brother. We share an inheritance. Romans 8. Romans 8. Let's see, 14. The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. And you did not receive the spirit of religious duty leading you back into fear of never being good enough. But you have received the spirit of full acceptance enfolding you into the family of God. And you will never feel orphaned. For as he rises up within you, our spirits join with him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved Father. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. Has the Spirit ever whispered that into you? You are God's beloved child. If he hasn't whispered that, let him whisper it into you. He's whispering all the time. He's talking all the time. He wants you to know if you don't, if you don't know your sonship, if you don't know your identity, it's over. It's over. I guarantee you'll fall prey to every wind and every doctrine because you don't know who you are. You ever get a bad salesman? And you can kind of talk them out of what they're selling? Oh, no, 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 I have this. It's much better. Oh, you do? Oh, what can I? Let me take a look at that. I've had a couple bad salesmen. But a good salesman, they're going to keep you on the hook. They're going to keep you there. They're going to wash your carpet. Just ask Aunt Lori, right? The bubbles with the Kirby. She was a Kirby lady. She used to make the foam real big so the kids could play in it, and then the kids are so happy because they're playing in the bubbles, right? And then the, then the parents have to buy the vacuum cleaner for a billion dollars. <laughs> There's other stories, too, but we'll stay away from those. And uh, <laughs> Oh, gosh. So... <laughs> but that good salesman, he keeps you on the hook. He keeps you on the hook. Well, I have news for you this morning that God is not a salesman. He doesn't want to sell you anything. He wants to give you everything. There's no money involved. It's a free purchase because he loves us. So let the Holy Spirit speak into your life and let him say, you are God's beloved son. You are God's beloved daughter. And by the way, every time I say son, I do mean daughter as well. 
I know this church gets it, but there's maybe people watching. But that's what I mean. But I, I'm, I'm serious, man. Like, if we don't grip what we are, what, what are we here for? Why are we here? Why are we on the planet? I don't, I don't when, when, I, when, I, when I think of my life outside of church, that doesn't happen, but when I think of my life exterior somewhere, it, it doesn't happen because it's all about my kingdom family. It's all about everywhere I love traveling this globe. I will travel this globe until I'm dead. I'm telling you, what else am I here for? Why else are we here? We're here to spread the gospel. We're here to spread the good news. We're here to help people. We're here, and it's, you know, sometimes it's, I was in the Amazon, and my first missions trip, we're floating on a boat down the river, and we're just stopping at villages, and I'm noticing we're not doing much like preaching or singing. We sang a little bit, but we weren't doing much of anything besides burning down the rainforest. I'll have you know. So they take a spot of land, they burn it down so they can grow their main crop is banana or yucca. But we would stop inside of these, these little towns and villages. We wouldn't preach. We, and we would, we'd hardly sing. We were there to help them. Help them with their fires. Help them drag stuff around. Help them float down to the next, the next thing. They're building something. We're helping them build something. Float down to the next town, next village. We're doing something else with them. That's kingdom. That's what we're here for. That's, that's what we're here for. We're here for each other. I'm, I'm here for you, and you're here for me. And when I think of myself outside of that, I'm, I'm empty. I'm empty. You know, you ever hear that, that old song? It's God shaped hole in all of us. No? <laughs> okay. Steve, you're right, I am old. There's a God shaped hole in all of us. And that's, but that, that's, what I, that's what I feel. I, I feel like that when I'm not serving, when I'm not doing something in the kingdom, when I'm not just inviting someone over for dinner, doesn't, it's not anything about a, a stage or a microphone. When I'm not doing family with my family, I feel empty. God's put that desire inside of us to fellowship with each other, to help each other through every issue, every problem, every Goliath. So in one way, it's, it's, it's up to you to help someone with their Goliath. Everybody has their own issues. They've got themselves where, they, where, they've, where they've gotten into. But next time when you're thinking about somebody, just don't forget about it. Step into it. Call them. Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Got you on my heart. So important. Hmm. I love uh, I love the Passion Translation. Switch over just for a second, though. Romans 8, 18. For I considered that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So twice inside of those two scriptures, I find myself a revelation. Not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. A revelation. 
for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Another revelation. Another surprise attack. Has God had his surprise attack in you yet? Because as I was just ranting about what are we here for, that's what we're here for. People are waiting for you to be awoken to your sonship to help. They're waiting for you. They're, it's, it, they're, they're eagerly, they're earnestly waiting. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for you to get your revelation. And I'm telling you, it happens once in a lifetime. Once in a lifetime. Now, it's not just going to happen once. Don't get me wrong. If you don't answer, it's going to happen again. But it's the same revelation. But there's, there's a different power inside of when, when you hear something for the second time, when you tell a story a second time, when you, there's something else that happens a second time, that kind of lessens and lessens and lessens. But let, let that not be with the revelation of sonship in, inside of you. Answer that call. Run after that call. Know that people are waiting. People are waiting. They're waiting. They're waiting. They're waiting for you. 70 AD happened. They're waiting for you. They want you. They want you. It's really cool. I was a little bit nervous. Last night I was up cooking and I was planning some stuff out for this morning. And this morning I got up and I was planning. And Amy didn't say a word to me. She didn't say a word to me. I was really nervous. This last time I spoke, I told her I was going to speak on it, and she's like, oh, that's, ah, let's just do this. And I was like, oh, okay. So I did. And, you know, it was love, yeah, but then you rolled over and fell asleep, and that was it. And I had to think about it the rest of the night. That was really cool. And then, so this morning, I'm on the way to church, and she says to me, the Lord spoke to me. I said, oh, yeah, what did he say? She goes, that you have the word of the Lord. And I was like, yes. Yes. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I, ha I have the word. Okay. But this week has been like, it's been like a challenge. It's been like, you ever have one of those weeks, it just weighs you down, vehicles and medical stuff and hospital stuff and Where is someone that doesn't know their sonship? Where is, when this happens to them, where are they? What, what, what do they fall prey to? Where do their thoughts go? Where, where does their mind drift to? Even as the son of God, sitting in the ER, I'm thinking, why am I here? I don't need to be here. I don't even, and all of a sudden, God's telling me, no, you don't need to be here. Let's move. I got things to do. He's <laughs> the testimony last week, right? Grandma Scrinzy fell down the stairs. Aunt Lori was upset, and she said, someone's getting saved today, or God's going to do something today as they're going to the emergency room. And someone actually was delivered, saved, and uh, set free from tons of demonic bondage, right? I just... This house is this house is is full full of sons and daughters of God. Okay, so if if I know that there you're, you might be on your journey, you might have no clue what I'm talking about, and you're just realizing now, I can be a son, I can be a daughter. He wants that, he wants that for me. Or you might be halfway on your journey. You might be somewhere inside of that journey. Wherever you are. Don't stop meeting with him. Don't let the Spirit stop speaking to you. Always keep yourself open to what's going on around you. Always have an open ear. Father always wants to tell you that he loves you. He always wants to do life with you. He always wants to share life with you.
Romans 8.35. Who could ever separate us from the endless love of God's anointing? Absolutely no one. Say, absolutely no one. No one is going to separate. It, it's up to you. This is up to you. Absolutely no one but yourself can separate you from the love of God. It's your decision on the power that comes in and out of your life. It's your decision on demonic activity inside of and outside of your life, like that comes in and out. What are we letting in? I gave this story a while back that the church that I used to go to, this lady, and we always tell this to the kids, we actually did yesterday, and uh, I was, I can't remember what I was saying to her, but um, her name's uh, Pastor Elaine, and it's almost kind of like that revelation that Chris had. If, if he, had, he was only 10% wrong and the other person was 90% wrong and God spoke to him and said, your 10% wrong is as bad as that 90%. So Pastor Elaine comes up to us, and she's talking about the, these brownies that she made. And she's just saying, she's, they're so good, and we want to know what the ingredients are. And she goes through all the ingredients, and at the very end, she says to us, and oh, there's one other, there's just a little bit of poop in those brownies. You won't, you won't taste it. You, you won't taste it. But there's just a little bit of poop in the brownies. This is a metaphor, okay? She didn't give me poop in the brownies. She's a very kind woman. And so, but she's, she's making this metaphor. But, but would you eat it then? No. But no, no, no. But there's just a little bit in there. There's just a little bit in there. And everybody's like, no, 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 no. Kind of a funny analogy, but it's sometimes what we let into our life. We let just a, a little bit of something in. We let a little bit of something in. We don't, we don't, we're like, oh, well that, that, okay, well, I, it's, it's, it's almost like you have this glass with a line on it. And you can fill it up, and I fill it, and I dump it out, and I tell my kid, and I dump it out, and I have this line. If it, as long as it doesn't go past this line, I'm going to be okay. Well, you're going to be okay, but you're going to have to deal with some consequences. How many of you have dealt with some consequences? You know, and sometimes we look at that as a dirty word. But I can tell you that there's good consequences too, right? There's good consequences to following God. There's good consequences to listening to the Spirit. And then there's bad consequences for that little bit of poop in the brownies. I mean, because you just ate poop. You know what I mean? We just have this, we have this tolerance level inside of us. And, and I don't know, some people are like, ah, oh, it's just Western culture or it's whatever. It's, it's a mentality that we, that we have, that you have, that I have, that's not, not sonship and it's not identity. And it's, they're easily labeled and easily defined, aren't they? When I'm sitting there watching a show, and Amy walks in, and I feel like I have to click it, I shouldn't have been watching that. The witness of Amy was bearing on me. When you're listening to some music, and all of a sudden it's just like, you know, on your Pandora station, and then Amy comes up to me and goes, what are you listening to? Why? Oh, I, just, I guess I should. Or if I'm thinking, you know, when I'm mowing, and I'm, oh, I shouldn't be. Tolerance. How much, are you, how much are you willing to tolerate in your life before, you have, before it has to leave? No, no poop. No poop in the brownies for me, thank you. I don't want it, you know? So we have to tell our kids. So funny, yesterday they're playing on the sand pile, throwing sand in each other's eyes. They're both screaming at each other, no! And I'm like, all right, everybody off the sand pile. They all come flying into the house, you know, and then we're left. Now look at each other, tell each other you love each other and hug each other. You know, you're going through the whole thing. And then Amy kind of kneels down and she goes, now you know about that saying with the poop in the brownies. And I was like, ugh, that's, <laughs> that's horrible. And, we're, and we were telling them about that. But if you don't teach them from a young age, 
If you don't teach them from a young age, they're not going to know. They're going to set their own tolerance levels. Have you ever got to that point when you have had an, you, you have a teenager and you're like, oh, what does, you know, I, I, just, I just walked into it. I mean, thank God I have a perfect teenager, though. I mean, Ava's, like, really perfect. And um, I'm not kidding. And she's really perfect. So she doesn't do anything wrong. And so I don't have to really worry about it. But I'm supposed to be more laughing than that, but it's okay. But I'm just walking into this, and I'm realizing that, like, as, as kids are on their phones and these things are happening and these communications are going out, and I'm not privy to it. That's a problem with me. That, that's a problem with me. You know, I, I, I feel bad. I just made all the kids delete Snapchat. It's like, kids, Snapchat's over. Oh, Dad, but that's the only way I communicate with your, my friends, and we can send each other funny faces, and we can do all that. And I'm like, I don't care. And I was like, you know why? I was like, because what happens is when that thing from Snapchat, Snapchat comes on, they see it, and then it's deleted. Daddy doesn't get to see it. They can save it, but mom and dad don't get to see it. Does that sound good? Does that sound good to you, or does that fi- sound a little divisive? There's something, I mean, whatever you got to do, you got to do. I'm just telling you what I'm doing. But I just thought about it, and I was like, I can't see what they're doing. They're 13. They can't drive a car, they can't vote, and they can't drink. I, you know, I got to keep a tally on something, and it's Snapchat. It, it's true. I'm t- These younger people are shaking their heads. <laughs> Did it happen to you, too? It happened. Forgive your dad. He knows what he's doing. I'm telling you. He knows exactly what he's doing. I'm kidding. But he doesn't know what he's doing. But if I let Ava build her own tolerance level, then she's going to establish the parameters for her own life. And that's, that's not her job. Her job is to grow and mature in the nurture and the admonition of the Father. That's her job as a 13-year-old and her only job. And school. That's her job. It's my job to protect her. It's my job to protect her. It's Ames' job to protect, protect her. So we have to set those parameters. I was reading something. Who could ever separate us from the endless love of God? The endless love of God's anointed one. Abs- absolutely no one. Excuse me. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love towards us. Troubles, pressures, and problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. What about persecutions, deprivation? dangers, and death threats. No, for they all are impotent to hinder his omnipotent love. Sitting there reading that this morning, and I literally, you English people are going to laugh at me. Actually, I actually tutored English too, this is bad. I was reading the word as omnipotent. I was, I was, you know, I was just, I'm thinking omni, right? Potent. And then I went to Google and pressed the button and they read it to me. And I, omnipotent. But what was so cool about that, as I was laughing at myself, was Omni, all. Potent, I got it here. Omni, all of all things. Potent, having great power, influence, or effect. Omnipotent, having ultimate power, able to do anything. Did you know omnipotent is actually a noun too? Did you know it's a noun? Do you know what it means? God. God. That's what it means. So if I read that again, 
what about persecutions, deprivation, dangers, and death threats? No, they're, they are all impotent to, hin- to hinder God's love. They're all impotent. Impotent, unable to take effect, action, helpless, and powerless. So these things that you're facing in your life, the Goliaths that you're facing in your life, you have to realize that they're powerless. They have no power unless you give them that power. It's up to you. It's up to you and your life. Or it's up to you to let that noun in. It's up to you to let the omnipotent in. To let God in. To let God's love in and wash over you. Ephesians 1.4, just in case you still don't believe me. And he chose us to be his very own, joining us to himself even before he laid the foundations of the universe. Even before he laid the foundations of the of the universe. Is that crazy? And then I ask myself, why am I here? What am I doing here? Why am I on this planet? Why are we, you know, Margie was talking about hurling around the universe, around this big ball, just hurling around the universe. Why in the world are we here? Why do we have all these Bibles? Why do we have all, why? why? Because God wants sons, man. Because God wants sons. I'm telling you, that's the only reason. God wants sons. He wants you. He wants your love. It's a two-way street. It's, it's got to be reciprocated. Do you reciprocate back? You know, a saw's all, a reciprocating saw, it, it works like this, and it cuts down through material. But if it only goes once one way, you're not going to get very far. If you only get that one word from God and it stops, you're not going to get very far. It's got to be reciprocating. It's, gotta, it's back and forth. It's all day long. It's, I'm telling you, it's all day long. And, 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 and as guys, we have the biggest issue with this. I'm just speaking from my, my own experience. And I've said it probably a hundred times. It's like you watch ladies in worship and they just... Watch guys in worship, and it takes them a minute. We're wondering, we're processing, we're what is God doing? What's He saying? What's He? What would happen? What would happen if, as soon as the music started, and, and this happened to me this morning? It took me like three songs to get into it. I'm just sitting, I'm just processing. I'm like, God, why am I processing? I don't want to process anymore. I don't want to think about it. I just want you to move on me and, and, and see things done. That's what I want to see. And into the third song, that's what I said to him. I, I just need, I need, I need, your, I need your voice. I need you to hear you. I need, I need something. And it's all this processing and stuff that's going on inside of me. And it was, it was like, a, it was a waste of energy. What if I started by raising my hands? What if, what if we just, in worship, we just started and said, just thank you, Father. If we, had, if we, had nothing, if we had nothing else to say. If we had nothing else to say. But as soon as one of these guys hit the first chord, we were just like, thank you, Father, for this day. I just give you all the praise. And all of a sudden, you're in it. Sonship revealed. And he chose us. He chose you to be his very own, joining us to himself even before he laid the foundations of the universe. Because of his great love, he ordained us so that we 
would be seen as holy in his eyes with an unsustained innocence. With an unsustained innocence. That's how he sees you. That's how he loves you. That's how he wants to kavar with you. That's how he wants to intertwine with you. When Chris gave that message in 2007, I just knew. I had I had to get more. I had to dig into something. I knew I, all of a sudden the sonship, the sonship like, it was revealed to me. The revelation hit. I'm a son of God. Now, well, now what do I do with this thing? You ever sit by yourself? You ever just start thinking about God and like the options are endless? It's like you, you realize what your gift is or you realize where you're at in life and you just like, and you want to just like, announce it to the world. But you don't know how. But you don't know how. You're awoken to sonship. And then you need purpose. And maybe there's some of you here this morning that just don't know what your purpose is. I'd love to pray for you. See if I get somebody on the keyboard and we can just all stand to our feet. We have a family picnic to attend today. I hope you all can make it. Really, really excited. It's at Arnold Park. We chose the other side of the Triple Cities this time instead of Port Dick. Those guys uh, in their toilet situation, they... It's a little stanky. So, but we have, we have a, we have a family get together today. We have a family picnic today. And I, and I hope you feel that way. I hope that when you come in to the church, you feel like family. I hope you do. I hope that you never wonder about that. I hope that you know if you stay in your own lane and stay focused on what God has purposed in your life for you to do, you can make it happen, man. You can go anywhere. You can do anything. But I knew, I knew as soon as Chris preached that message that I had to do something, and that's when we first started our discipleship classes. And there was a couple of us that went, and we went on for a couple years. And then we got so hungry that we were, we just want, we wanted Thursday mornings too. And I just thank God for a leader that would invite me over to his house at 6 a.m. And Pastor Margie too. Thank God she got in the car with him. Thank God she got in the car with him day after day after day. But thank God for leaders that would invite you into their house two weeks a morning from six to eight. Some of them were, com you know, not complete strangers, but like some BU kids and stuff like that, that, you know, they were here, they were, they were gone, they were back home. They were... But it's that, it's that revelation that sparks something inside of you. That makes it so easy to grab onto your purpose and run with it and not be distracted by the other things that are going around, what other people are doing and what, who's preaching or who's doing this and who's doing that. So I'm just going to pray, but as soon as I'm done, if, if you feel like you have a lack of purpose, you haven't found your purpose, I want to help you find it. So please come up and see me. I, I want to pray for you. I'd love to see this ignition happen inside of you when you grab your purpose. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for we thank you for life, Father. We thank you for our life here. We thank you for our local church. And we thank you what you've assigned us to do. Father, I thank you that we will not be stopped. 
because we will remain focused on the things that you have in front of us, Father. Let each person that runs inside of our fellowship, Father, run in their lane, Father, to the point where they're doing such an excellent job on what, what they're doing that it just starts to expand. It just starts to grow. That ministry just starts to grow. They need to have other people under them, Father, and, and training other people to do different things. And what, what, whatever that looks like, Father, just help us to stay inside of our lane. Father, I thank you for giving us your spirit that just comes in and breathes into us that you love us. Thank you for a spirit that comes to us and says that you are God's beloved child. Father, we accept that. We accept our identity and we accept our sonship in you. We just love you so much, Lord. Father, we thank you for this afternoon as we get together and have fun at the park. Father, I just pray safety over the um, over all the activities that we have going on there. Father, we just thank you for food. We thank you for fellowship. Just bless this house. Amen. Amen.